is over. We've got 300, 300 plus departures out of Vancouver, 350 stops in Victoria this year. I mean, it's just a banner year for cruise, but if this gets out in the industry and it happens to more and more ships, that industry is not going to be looking very favorably upon Vancouver. BC Tourism says the Celebrity Eclipse was able to leave the berth with help from a private operator. The ship will complete most of its itinerary but skip a stop in Icy Strait, Alaska due to the lost time. Vancouver Airport officials are looking for answers after travelers were stuck in hours-long security screening lineups yesterday, all due to last-minute staffing shortages. According to officials, more than a third of security screeners did not clock into work yesterday, leaving managers scrambling to facilitate the 70,000 people coming through the airport. YVR believes it's related to ongoing job action. Neither Allied Universal, the company that supplies the workers, nor the union were available for an interview. YVR says staffing levels for today have returned to normal. Homicide investigators have identified the 37-year-old man shot and killed in South Surrey over the weekend. Troy Michael Regnier died after being shot multiple times on Saturday night. Surrey RCMP arrested three suspects at the scene who were believed to have known the victim. No charges have been laid. The Integrated Homicide Investigation Unit has since taken over the investigation. Anyone with information about the shooting is asked to contact IHIT using the information seen there on your screen. Vancouver police have identified the suspects in the violent assault of a man following last month's Pride Parade. All three are under the age of 18. The attack happened outside a convenience store on the corner of Commercial Drive and East 10th. A 42-year-old man stopped to buy a Slurpee. He had a confrontation with another patron that was waiting in line. He then left the store and was jumped by the three teens. BPD says tips poured in after video of the incident was shared over the weekend, including one from a family member of one of the alleged assailants. So far, though, no arrests have been made. A former inmate is upset he can't join a class action lawsuit targeting the use of solitary confinement. Al Hickey lives in British Columbia, but in the late 1990s, he served time in Newfoundland. Because of provincial rules, Hickey will miss out on any compensation. Ariana Kelland explains. 43-year-old Al Hickey lives on his boat floating off the coast of B.C. With just his dog in tow, it's a life of isolation, and it's how he likes it. I found beauty in my, my solitude, don't get me wrong, uh, a lot of it. I, I, I know how beautiful nature is, uh, but I've missed out on the beauty of humanity. He says one of the reasons for that can be traced back to his time in a jail cell on the other side of the country. Hickey is from Newfoundland and Labrador. In 1998, he served time at Her Majesty's Penitentiary for petty crimes. They put me in the hole for two and a half weeks with another guy and didn't let us out once, not once, uh, in two and a half weeks. And the hole, basically there's enough room when you walk in there, there's uh, directly in front of you, there's a raised concrete slab that's got enough room for a mattress. And then in front of that, there's enough room for another mattress. And then there's a toilet. And uh, that's it. There's no room to walk. There's no room to move. The use of solitary confinement is the subject of a class action lawsuit targeting the Newfoundland and Labrador government. But Hickey isn't part of that. Here's why. Most provinces in Canada have an opt-out class action system, meaning you're automatically included in a class action lawsuit whether you know about it or not. But that's not the case here in Newfoundland and Labrador or in New Brunswick. A non-resident has to hear about a lawsuit, then indicate their intent to sign on within a time frame set out by the courts. Hickey had 90 days. In the case of the gentleman in Newfoundland who didn't know about the action and didn't opt in in time, um, it means that he can't uh, participate in the settlement. And if he wishes to seek compensation for his damages resulting from solitary confinement, he's going to have to uh, start his own individual litigation. In a statement, the province says it has no plans on amending that legislation to bring it in line with the rest of Canada. So that leaves people like Hickey, who found out too late about the lawsuit, to go it alone. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. It's a dire warning of floods, droughts and major storms.
climate change events that could wipe out the province's highways, rail lines and power grids and could cost the Canadian economy $139 billion over the next 30 years. As Janella Hamilton reports, experts say B.C. is particularly vulnerable because of its topography. When the mountains funnel all that water from, from these rainfall events that produce floods, it's funneling it right down into those valley bottoms where we've got those roads and that rail. Kai Chan is a professor at UBC's Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability. He says Aquanomics, a new report released today, puts an eye-opening dollar amount on the long-lasting impacts of climate change across Canada, and specifically here in BC. Just having like one or two routes east-west through the province, that you really have that kind of, you know, suffering of economic hardship as well as social hardship. The report points to last year's floods, which for a time cut off rail and highway links between the country's biggest port in Vancouver and the rest of Canada. The disruption stressed supply chains already hampered by COVID-19, causing prices to spike, slowing down production in factories, and leaving some shelves empty in grocery stores and other retailers. When we're thinking about investment, a real consideration from a monetary standpoint needs to be that overall, uh, that overall picture. So not just those direct impacts, but what we're going to see for years and years to come. This green economy expert says down the line, the financial sector in Canada will also be greatly influenced by climate change. Carbon pollution has not been included when you go and get your loan or go and get an investment. But all these financial um, institutions around the world are slowly having to share what is the risk of climate in this project. The report predicts manufacturing and distribution will take the biggest hit from water-related climate disasters between now and 2050, an estimated $64 billion in losses. We've got to plan in a way that accounts for the fact that this world is a different place when, than when these roads and rail lines and bridges were first installed decades ago. Chan says in order to prepare and avoid further strain on the supply chain, governments and municipalities need to work together to build infrastructure in a way that will be resilient to natural disasters. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. Crews are monitoring conditions at East Sook Regional Park on Vancouver Island after a wildfire broke out today. The brush fire, approximately one acre in size, was reported by boaters who were sailing nearby. Crews were able to quickly set up a perimeter and extinguish the blaze. The cause of the fire, though, remains unknown. And to meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff now, Joe, every time we get that warmer weather, we immediately see that fire risk tick up. Yeah, you're right, Leanne, and you can really see it today, especially across the south coast. Take a look at the fire danger map. It really sort of highlights the past two stories, both uh, the fire danger across the island and the extreme uh, floods and storms that we're worried about in the future, because we're seeing both of those across the province today. You can see those reds on the island in the south coast where fire danger is at extreme, and then the blues and the greens in through central BC, where we're dealing with an atmospheric river right now. And these are the current warnings. We have rainfall and extreme heat warnings in place right now. So two very different stories. If you're under the high pressure system, which includes East Vancouver Island, the Sunshine Coast, Fraser Canyon, that's where humid X values will be into the mid to high 30s over the next couple of days with warm overnight back up towards uh, Stewart, Kitimat, Prince Rupert, Rainfall warnings for totals will exceed 100 millimeters by tomorrow midday. And that is because we're getting the end of a fire hose uh, directed right at Haida Gwaii pushing inland. This is an atmospheric river and really the first big rain event we've seen for that region uh, since last spring. So we are worried about washouts in the region. Uh, Prince Rupert has already seen about 90 millimeters of rain uh, since the rain began yesterday evening. So Leanne, a tale of Two extremes today, but I'll take you through the long-range forecast, and uh, it changes quite a bit. Okay, we'll be watching for that. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. There are lots of ways to avoid dealing with morning traffic, walking, riding your bike, even taking transit. But one BC man is taking the commute to new depths by swimming to work. 
Kelowna's Brent Hobbs swims along the shore of Okanagan Lake to work twice a week. Yes, there he is. The watery trip is about 1.8 kilometers or around just 30 minutes for him, all while towing a waterproof bag with his laptop and a change of clothes in it. The 54-year-old trains for triathlons and saw swimming as an environmentally friendly and healthy way to get to work. Oh, it's just uh, super refreshing, eh? <laughs> During a heat wave. No better way of getting to work. It's nice and cool. It's just me and the carp. <laughs> Hobbs gets up close and personal with wildlife pretty regularly on his commute, even accidentally getting too close to a beaver once and getting slapped by its tail. The B.C. government has created a $60 million fund to help expand meal programs for school children. School districts with existing meal and snack programs will use this additional funding to provide access to more students. And I expect that some districts will also use this funding to ensure that students are sent home with food over weekends and holidays. The province says the one-time funding will also cover things like supplies to help parents who are struggling financially right now. An additional $3.8 million will also be given to private schools to also help families who are trying to make ends meet. And, you know, this is part of um, the public funding that goes into our private schools each year, which is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't think sometimes all taxpayers uh, realize that uh, private schools also get a portion of public funding. And um, that's a concern to me, given the financial struggles, struggles that our public schools have. I would prefer to see public funding only going to public schools that are democratically governed and private schools be privately funded. Critics say that public school system is already not adequately funded to meet students' needs and that giving money to private schools will not help children who are most in need. With the cost of living rising everywhere, an animal charity is doing its part to ease the burden on pet owners. The Regional Animal Protection Society in Richmond is offering free pet food to people facing financial challenges. Yasmin Gandam has more. <laughs> Smiles and laughter as people dug through bins of free cat and dog food, happy that they don't have to worry about feeding their pets. Well, it's really comforting to know that we can give our, our cats the high quality food and we don't have to worry about the price of it. Some coming for the first time due to inflation rates making it almost impossible for people to make sure their pets get fed. Not, not, not the same as it used to be, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, this is a good thing. This is a one-of-a-kind thrift store and they're very good people here. And Raps agrees, saying the demand has never been this high. And the cost to us is, is just enormous, but the need has more than quadrupled uh, compared to past years. We all know that the inflation rate's going up, you know, and people aren't making as much money uh, to go with that inflation. So having an opportunity to get something for free is, uh, you know, is important. You know, it helps the, uh, the individual themselves, but also it makes sure that their animals are being looked after. According to Statistics Canada, food prices nationally have risen by 9.7% in the past year, the largest increase in a one-year period since September of 1981. But Rapp says it's more than just food. Veterinary care is extremely expensive these days, and a lot of people just can't afford it. Your middle-class family, your average middle-class family cannot afford veterinary care. A $5,000 bill for a surgery. And that's why we're there to help. The hospital has provided over $3.5 million in partially or fully subsidized care in the past four years. Yasmin Gantam, CBC News, Richmond. Kids will return to class next week and most of the rules around masking and restrictions are lifted. So how do you get your kids ready and what precautions do you want to take? Dr. Melissa Lem talks pandemic and schools next. And thanks for watching our commercial-free live stream. Finding success in the film and television industry can be challenging. But in Alberta, a new program is teaching Indigenous students what it takes. Terry Tremba has more. Hanging by wires in a stunt vest, Dan McMaster is all smiles. They're in the last day of the Counting Coup Indigenous Film Academy. 
It's put me on a path now. And it's like, I have stories and I have stories that need to be told. And this is the, this is the best way to tell them. For the past three months, McMaster and 15 other students have been learning the ins and outs of the business, from stunt work to writing, acting, and producing. Jessica Matten, who is Cree, co-founded the program. She has been in the industry for 20 years, most recently a leading role in Dark Winds on AMC. Everything I teach, I want to empower and seriously empower them to continue it on and be the leaders of the community. Susan Solway, the chairperson of Old Sun Community College, would like to see the course continue to be offered. If we can get a full-time program, you know, eventually down the road with it, where it could be uh, a credit and transferable credits to, you know, the states, the University of Calgary and so forth, that would kind of be the ultimate goal, I think. But at the same time, um, we do have to acknowledge that not everybody wants to go down that degree route. McMaster says above everything they've learned, connecting it to their culture has been the biggest lesson. Filmmaking is just a lot like living like a Blackfoot. You know, that everybody works together, everybody has a role, everybody helps everybody. McMaster graduates with their classmates on Monday with plans to make a full-length documentary next summer. Terry Trembath, CBC News, Six Sigma Nation. In about a week, kids across this province will be heading back to school. But with COVID-19 still spreading, some parents say the BC guidelines released this week are far too lenient. CBC's Janella Hamilton hears from one mom with a chronic lung condition who feels not enough is being done to keep families safe. We know that the federal government gave $11.9 million to the province, and so we really would like to know how that money is being spent. Kayenta Martins is the mother of two children, one in elementary and one entering high school. She says parents still don't know which schools have received ventilation upgrades this summer and which ones haven't. That's a major concern for her family as she lives with COPD, a chronic lung condition. We've asked for Corsi Rosenthal boxes, which are a low cost option for HEPA filtration in classrooms. We've asked for indoor air quality monitors to monitor the CO2 in classrooms to know how much air is being rebreathed, and we're not seeing that either. The Vancouver School Board says federal funding was invested in new ventilation for portable sites, as well as refurbishing dozens of air supply units in classrooms, gyms, and auditoriums. The Ministry of Health says about 4% of classrooms have no mechanical ventilation and that the province is providing funding to school districts to install standalone HEPA filtration units. We had hoped that those uh, tools would be used or put in place over the summer so that we'd be ready for the fall. And, you know, here we are a week and a half before the beginning of school, and we don't know what's been done. 
The BC School Trustees Association says staff have been working hand in hand with the BCCDC and the public health organization over the summer. If things change, we will be ready to uh, use that COVID word to pivot again if we need to. In a release Thursday, Provincial Health Officer Bonnie Henry said with higher levels of immunity, she doesn't see broad mass mandates returning. Martins fears the province is being reactionary instead of taking a proactive approach, making her nervous about her kids returning to the classroom. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. And to help kids and parents get ready for what the school year brings, I'm joined by Dr. Melissa Lem. Dr. Lem is a family doctor and our in-house medical columnist. So, Dr. Lem, thanks for joining us. We've been hearing messages about getting the vaccine for a long time now. What do we know about vaccine uptake around uh, an immunity with uh, school-age children? It varies with age groups. So right now, unfortunately, kids age 5 to 12, 5 to 11, they only have about 50% full vaccination uptake, whereas for kids 12 and older, they have between 80 and 90%. So it's really different. And I think the reasons are vaccines were released for younger kids later, and so people had already, um, they were getting a bit of vaccine fatigue. And also a lot of children, a lot of adults too, have gotten COVID by this point. So parents are feeling like they don't have to get their kids vaccinated. But that's not true. It's still really important to get kids fully vaccinated because immunity from vaccinations lasts longer than that from illness. And also it's protecting ourselves and our communities as well. For sure. And so knowing those numbers, especially kind of the, the, the younger kids category, only around 50%, how concerned should parents be about sending their kids back to school then this September? I think we should be as concerned as any other time in the pandemic. So I know a lot of the protections have been lifted by public health, but case uh, numbers of COVID-19 are just as high now as they have been at other times in the pandemic, just because we don't have mandatory masking anymore and all the gathering restrictions have been lifted. It doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet. So I think we should still be encouraging our kids to mask when they can, making sure that we gather outdoors and making sure they know how to practice good hand hygiene and do all those great things that kept them healthy uh, during other times of the pandemic. And so, as you say, you know, mandatory masking is no longer on the table. And it seems most people now, as I go down the street, nobody's really wearing the mask anymore. So, but what if your kids are insisting on wearing masks in school and, and you're worried that, you know, other kids might bully them or whatnot? What, what are you saying to, to those kids? Do you know what I think the better question is, Leanne, is what if your kid doesn't want to wear a mask? And I mm -hmm. think something that's been lost in this whole conversation is throughout this entire pandemic, even when the protections have been lifted, Health Canada has recommended when you're indoors in public places, you should still be masking, even though it's not mandatory. And that's based on the latest scientific evidence. So I think we should really be encouraging our kids to mask up when they head back to school because they'll be indoors, they'll, there'll be more viruses circulating, and there's a higher chance that they'll bring COVID-19 home. So I think we should still be concerned. And so the ones that want to wear the mask, we got to give them kudos and tell, encourage them to do it. All right, so how do we prepare kids and ourselves or dealing with the mental health challenges of, of, of going back. It's, it's been a while. I think we have to get back to basics. So we do all those things that keep us healthy, that will keep us mentally well as, as well. So kids thrive on routine. So make sure they're eating healthy, make sure they're getting enough sleep and make sure they're exercising regularly. And something really important too is making sure they get enough outdoor time. It's not just important in the summertime. It's also important through the school year. It boosts immunity. And when we gather outdoors, that's going to keep us safer from COVID-19 as well. For sure. So bundle up and, and head outdoors again. All right. Always great to have you with us, Dr. Melissa Lem. Thank you. A stern new warning that you might want to pause before cracking a cold one or popping the cork off a wine bottle. Why the dangers of alcohol are even greater than first thought. That's next. There has to be something wrong when the province newspaper box is empty right outside the place where it's published. They were empty all over the Lower Mainland today. The province lost 50 cents 100,000 times. Workers only printed enough to stock stores and some home deliveries. I think people just didn't work with the, with the usual enthusiasm um, that they have for their job. And uh, I think they're very disappointed in the company's position at the bargaining table. Outside the presses, big rolls of newsprint waited all day. Sun and province delivery trucks sat empty. 
The disruptions at the Sun and the province today could soon explode into a major problem for their owner, Pacific Press. In less than three weeks, the Sun will become a morning paper. And that's a move designed to win back lost subscribers and restore dwindling ad revenues. But the unions could put the kibosh to that plan. The early morning sun will not go out if there are not signed contracts. That means a strike or a lockout. This media analyst says the stakes are high. Well, if the labor situation gets to the point of a shutdown as we've had in the past, that certainly does damage the papers. It takes them quite a period to recover their full readership. Producing a paper isn't the only problem facing the sun. It may have trouble delivering a morning paper. Hundreds of paper carriers are quitting. The reason? It's too early in the morning. I don't want to get up that early in the morning. I couldn't get up that early. That's why the Sun has full page ads for new and older carriers. What it means is that there's going to be a switch to adult carriers because uh, if you're going to morning publication, you need adults to deliver the paper. Uh, many parents do not want their children to be uh, out that early in the morning, particularly in the wintertime when it's dark and snowy perhaps. You might wonder what Pacific Press has to say about all this. Well, the president, Stu Noble, refused interviews today, claiming the negotiations are at too delicate a stage. For the CBC Evening News, I'm Bob Nixon in Vancouver. The Liberal government says the delivery of federal services is improving. Today, the task force responsible for reducing wait times for passports, visas and at airports reported things are getting better. But as Paige Parsons reports, many international students are still waiting on visas, with classes set to start in just days. Where I was like dreams on hold. So I'm like I'm literally hanging on by a thread here. International students like Naman Gupta were hoping to start classes at Canadian universities and colleges this fall, but delays in processing student visas mean they're stuck in their home countries. I'm pretty sad about it, to be really honest, because all my plans for this particular year got like slashed out in a in a heartbeat. To come to Canada, international students have to pay up front, and the cost is much higher for them than for Canadian students. Dinesh Kamath has paid about $26,000, but because his visa is delayed, he can't start class at York University until January. So that's how it is, but the loan which I took and the interest which I have to pay on it is something which is uh, demanding right now. Before the pandemic, we used to get the decisions in week, one week, two weeks, and in many instances, we actually used to get them within 48 to 72 hours. But now it's taking four to six months. This international student recruiter says he has more than 100 clients in India whose study plans have been disrupted by delays. He says the once smooth process has become unpredictable. The federal government says they are doing everything they can to get students to Canada in time for the start of the semester. We expect that we're going to uh, process a little more than 104,000 additional study permits. Uh, there has been an absolute uh, explosion in demand uh, when it comes to Canada's international student program in recent years. The backlog of student visas is just one of several problems a task force of federal ministers says they've made progress on, including delays, passport applications and hiring airport screening staff. Nobody should be congratulating themselves for having done their jobs. Um, this, um, we are not by, not by no stretch of the imagination out of the woods yet. 
96% of Canadians who applied for a passport in person are going to get their passport within 10 business days. For those who use the mail-in system, which is still quite delayed, the federal government says you can call Service Canada for help. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, with the weekend behind us, many Canadians likely uncorked a bottle of wine or cracked open a cold one, if not more. But that brings back an old question. How much alcohol is considered safe to consume? As Ioana Romeliotis finds out, it's far less than what many assume. You might want to put down your drink to hear this. No amount of alcohol is safe. Your risks start to increase at one standard drink per week. And really, our main message is that less is better. A new report from the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction says the science has evolved and so must the guidance. Low risk is now defined as two or fewer standard drinks a week. Any more than that and the risks start climbing fast. Three to five drinks a week increases the risk of developing certain cancers. More than seven drinks a week also increases your risk of heart disease and stroke. The danger goes up with every additional drink. Overall, it's not good for your health. As for any health benefits, the report found none. One of the reasons why previously um, the guidelines were higher is that there was this uh, conception that alcohol had some benefits um, with regards to some cardiovascular diseases. More recent studies now find that that is probably not the case anymore. The new proposed recommendations are a sobering shift from Canada's 2011 guidelines, which recommend no more than 15 drinks a week for men and 10 drinks a week for women. Many Canadians drink more than that, unaware of the health risks, especially for women, whose risk of developing breast cancer goes up with just three drinks a week. I think that this is going to save a lot of lives. Ali Garber's mom and grandmother had breast cancer. She found out about the link after she quit drinking. I think that women in large part were not aware of the inherent increased risk of breast cancer that came with you know, a certain amount of, of alcohol consumption. I know I was floored when I learned about it. Some public health authorities have already started warning people about the cancer risk. And more education is key, the report says, including labeling how many drinks are in alcohol containers. But cancer specialists want even more, including cancer warning labels like these that were piloted in Yukon liquor stores in 2017. There's also evidence if you change the warning a little bit, you can increase awareness. So the more you drink, the more cancer you get. Like, that's, that's the bottom line. The report says the proposed recommendations are a start and more can be done to inform Canadians of the risks that come with every drink. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. A restaurant northeast of Toronto has been shut down after several patrons were sent to hospital of an apparent poisoning. As CBC's Thomas Stegler reports, the problem may center on one particular dish. A popular restaurant abruptly shut down by public health. What happened here, sending multiple diners to hospital, is so far a mystery. It's hard to believe you know, it is. And it just opened. I brought my little boy here, he's two, and everything was fine. Public health officials are investigating after they say several individuals became seriously ill following a meal at Delight Restaurant and Barbecue. A Toronto critical care specialist tweeted, a notice has been circulating about this poisoning event, which has apparently affected multiple patients sent to different hospitals. This man came and ate here with his family Sunday night. I guess I got to wait and I'm just watching my son if he's going to be sick. Delight Restaurant and Barbecue displays a health inspection certificate from May, but no notice about why it's now closed. This expert spoke to doctors who've treated some patients after they ate a chicken dish. Some of the patients became quite sick with uh, irregularities of their heartbeat, uh, including at least one patient who required intensive care. He says the symptoms are consistent with a poisoning involving aconite, a plant used in ancient Chinese medicine, but so dangerous it's nicknamed the queen of poisons. Public health says the restaurant is cooperating with the investigation. And in the meantime, officials are telling anyone with leftovers at home to throw them out. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Markham, Ontario.
The Ukrainian military has confirmed launching offensive operations in the south of the country. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky telling occupying Russians to flee if they want to survive. Anyone who wants to know what our plans are, you won't hear specifics, Zelensky said in his evening address. But we will pursue Russian occupiers right to Ukraine's borders. Ukraine has been openly preparing for a major counteroffensive in the south for weeks. Russians are now finding themselves unwelcome beyond Ukraine's borders as well. As Briar Stewart explains, Estonia is banning Russian tourists, and it wants that to become policy across Europe. The pomp of a Russian flag-raising ceremony. A spectacle even for those living just across the river in Estonia. Russia, привет. Most living here are like Natalia Lagutina, Russian speaking with close family living across the border. I don't believe Putin was the first to start the war. Don't believe it, she says. This former Soviet Republic is connected to Russia by the now ironically named Friendship Bridge. So yeah. where exactly is the border? The border is in this red point on the grey fence. About 5,000 people cross every day, but Russians holding Estonian tourist visas won't be allowed through unless they're exempted for humanitarian reasons. Estonian officials think this ban will affect about 50,000 people, but they want to prevent more Russians from coming over this bridge. They want to turn anyone away with the Schengen area visa, and they're calling for other European countries to get on board. The Baltic countries and Finland support the move, but other nations don't, saying a ban unfairly punishes ordinary Russians. Estonia's foreign minister doesn't buy that. We have to, uh, to, to have to also give a strong push to the Russian society to wake up. You can't just walk on the streets of Moscow, Moscow or St. Petersburg or Berlin uh, mm, uh, as a tourist, just uh, eyes wide shut. On the streets of Estonia's capital, many feel the same. Nothing will happen until people themselves stand up and, and make their voice heard. Yeah, I think that gives out like a clear signal to Russia that the things they're doing are not okay. Back on the border, it's not surprising we didn't find anyone who supports the ban. This is like Soviet times when there was an iron curtain, he said. <laughs> Valentina Plakova is Russian but lives in Estonia. She crosses the border to buy crosswords. We're always being blamed. As the former emperor once said, Russia has two friends, the army and the navy. That friendship bridge could soon have a lot less traffic because Estonia is promising to move forward with a wider ban even if the rest of the EU doesn't agree. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Narva, Estonia. Areas of the country cut off, hundreds dead, and the economic impact shattering. The latest on the deadly flooding in Pakistan, next.
International aid has started trickling into Pakistan as it deals with widespread flooding. This year's abnormally heavy monsoon rains have mostly stopped, but the disastrous floods they helped spawn have not. Report reporter Rebecca Bandon has more. The extreme flooding in Pakistan amid torrential monsoon rains is considered one of the worst floods in recent history. It's been declared a national emergency. Millions of people have been displaced. Hundreds of thousands of homes have been destroyed. Crops and villages have been swept away as rivers swell. There are reports of people being swept away, including children, and others have been killed by landslides. Millions of people are in need of food, shelter and water. But it's been hard for rescue teams to reach some flood-affected areas because roads have been destroyed and the only way to get to some parts is by helicopter. Rescue operations are ongoing, including by the armed forces, as they try to get people to safety. Pakistan's government is blaming climate change for the flooding. Some countries have already lent support. But Pakistan is calling for more international financial aid to help it manage this situation. It's estimated that rehabilitation and reconstruction efforts could take years, given the extent of the damage. Rebecca Bundan for CBC News, Mumbai. And Johanna Wagstaff joins us again. Joe, heartbreaking to see those pictures out mm -hmm. of Pakistan. Yeah, truly, Leanna. And the situation is not over yet. We've had eight steady weeks of monsoon ra rains and still a few more weeks before that pattern typically shifts, but just the compounding impacts of a warmer climate, the melting glaciers in the region and the extreme heat waves that they saw through the spring and the summer leading to uh, such devastating washouts. We'll keep you posted on that story. Uh, taking you back to BC and the current temperatures because we're looking at a bit of a heat up. That will be our weather story over the next couple of days across the southern half of the province. Very different story and through Northern coastal sections where you're getting hammered with rain tonight. Abbotsford, 30 degrees right now. And out towards uh, Soyuz, 32. And in through the Kootenays, uh, high 20s tonight. We're going to really start to notice those overnight tonight and tomorrow night. Stay up in the mid to high teens. And that's why the heat warning has been issued for parts of the island, Sunshine Coast and the Fraser Canyon. But we're talking warm temperatures for a big swath of BC. Watch they take you through Wednesday. You can see those afternoon highs getting into the mid 30s for the Okanagan. Coming down a little bit for the second half of the week. And it's Friday, we start to see our weather models really diverge. Unfortunately, it is lining up with that long weekend where not only we have a lot of plans, but we're also at the end of a long, hot, dry stretch. So watching the end this time of the year of these kinds of events very closely, both for new fire starts, and we are starting to see drought conditions across the south. So it'd be nice to get the rain, uh, but yes, let's see if it times up for the long weekend. So high pressure right now, you can see that atmospheric river hitting the north coast, easing by tomorrow afternoon. A little bit of instability Wednesday afternoon in through the interior, but generally dry and sunny for the next 
a few days. You can see that exception in through Haida Gwaii and Prince Rupert. Lots of sun, though, across the province, above seasonal by a couple of degrees. We're really starting to lose that sun. Uh, you know, we're not into the fall season yet, but we're starting to shift. And that means that uh, we're, we're really into the late summer season when it comes to weather events. So fire danger uh, will begin to drop, but unfortunately, it's the kind of setup where we will be worried about it over the next few days. So I mentioned the diver diverging forecast that really happens on Friday. Uh, right now, I'm leaning towards the model that keeps us sunny and dry through most of the weekend. Leanne may be bringing the rain in for Monday, but there is a chance we could see showers as early as Friday. So hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get uh, some clarity on that tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. I know you'll keep an eye on it. Thanks, Joe. I will. You're welcome. NASA has called off today's launch of its Artemis 1 moon rocket after some last-minute issues. It's meant to be the first big step towards the future of transporting humans back to the moon. Shayla Bernstein reports. The excitement of launch day ultimately fizzled into an all-systems no. We don't launch until it's right. If tricky weather and lightning strikes in recent days weren't enough, last-minute issues sprang up with one of the rocket's four engines. The team worked through a number of issues today. Uh, the team was tired at the end of the day, and we just decided that it was the best to knock it off. Each launch costs an estimated four billion U.S. dollars. The price tag of the entire Artemis mission, 93 billion. The end goal is to send humans to the moon and set up bases for long-term exploration. But the first step is a trial run. The next window to launch an uncrewed test flight is Friday. We really need time to look at um, all the all the information, all the data, and um, you know we, we're gonna we're gonna play all nine innings here. At a viewing party at the Edmonton Science Center, the cancellation left astronomy fans feeling a bit let down. Kind of disappointing, but that's okay. This is really the first big, big mission by NASA since who knows when. Half a century, in fact. 1972 was the last time humans walked on the moon. More powerful than the Saturn V used during the Apollo years, the Artemis rocket is the most complex ever built. That's why engineers want to iron out all the issues without humans on board. We're used to these delays in, the, in, this, in this business because it's so dangerous, it's so complicated. He speaks from experience. David Saint-Jacques spent 204 days on the International Space Station. The little boy in me is disappointed. I wanted to see the excitement of a rocket launch, this great new rocket, the beginning of a new era of exploration, back to the moon, ultimately eventually to Mars. But the sober engineer in me, you guys, whew, glad that someone found that problem. Better to work out the kinks now before astronauts climb aboard. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. The U.S. Open Tennis Championship is underway in New York, and Serena Williams ensured that this evening's game won't be her last. CBC's Chris Reyes has more on her legacy as the tennis great plays her final tournament in New York. Well, it's the Serena Love Fest here at the U.S. Open in New York. Her fans, her peers all gushing in awe of her legendary career, her impact on the sport. This, of course, comes after she made the announcement earlier this month that she plans to evolve away from tennis, which means that this could be her final Grand Slam. And you know what? The ticket sales show it. Tickets started selling fast as soon as she made the announcement. It's a sold-out game. The average price of tickets is about $1,000 for a first-round game. Now, that's no surprise. Fans love her. They lo they've loved her for a long time. It's hard to measure her impact on the sport. She's been playing professional tennis for more than two decades. She has a total of 23 grand slams, the most of any player in the open era, about $100 million in prize money along the way. She has shattered records, broken barriers. She has been loud and proud about her powerful and emotional play. She has weathered criticisms about her fashion, her hair, her style, her race, her gender. And for that reason, she says that even if she's evolving away from tennis, she vows to keep fighting for women and women of color and that her next chapter includes an investment fund called Serena Ventures, where she plans to invest in founders in the margins. 
She says that that's all a part of her larger story. She says she doesn't like to use the word retirement, that she doesn't want to leave the game that she loves, but she wants to know what's next. In, again, in that story that started, in her own words, in Compton, California, about a little black girl who just wanted to play tennis. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. His signs have caused plenty of mirth and laughter in North Vancouver, but a funny man is putting his ladder aside. We look at his humorous legacy next. I've been looking for home for, I guess, about two years with my realtor, um, and so I just was not having any luck winning any blind bidding and so um, while we were looking around I kind of saw this pop up in my MLS when we were looking and I'm like oh you know it seems to check all my boxes it's coming up for auction the bidding process you know it was kind of fun you get the little dopamine burst when you click the bid button and it was significantly less stressful than blind bidding um, and everything like seemed to be okay. I guess it was like sort of just a few days after that, cause my contractor friend was coming here to help work on the house. We were just gonna do some coats of paint, patch the damage, maybe think about redoing the flooring. So all the flooring came up. I was not here when it was happening. And then all of a sudden my contractor contacts me. He's like, I think your house has been in a fire. And he just sort of reaches his hand into one part of the closet and just like snaps off charcoal that was subfloor. So we ended up having to gut the entire upstairs. We tore up the basement, looked into the water damage. That's when sort of we found there was a little bit of a like mildew and pink mold problem. By the time I gathered all the quotes together, um, it was something like over $100,000 of issues with the property. And so we're like, okay, gave them to my lawyer. I'm like, here's what I've paid for. Here's what I have quotes for. What is reasonable that a proper home inspection should have captured? Because I understand, you know, there's always going to be things in a home. No home is perfect. And there are things that are hidden that, you know, you can't fault a inspector for, you know, like the charred joists in the floor. No inspector could have seen that, but they could have identified that this house was missing three cold air returns. And they could have identified that you can view the charred subfloor from the laundry room and you can see some of the charring under the joists. And had I been more educated and known, but I mean, you know, that's why you count on inspectors, right? You can't know everything about everything. And I'm a first time home, I, home buyer, excuse me. So, you know, I counted on unreserved inspection and you know, I think they completely failed me. It wouldn't have hurt their, you know, back end their business model to actually give a shit about someone who trusted them and purchased a property through them. There's an iconic display panel in North Vancouver that's been sparking laughter among people passing by for more than 30 years. But the man behind the playful signs is signing off for good. As Janella Hamilton reports, his departure isn't going unnoticed. Bob Gibson has changed this sign hundreds of times before, but this time is different. After more than three decades, he will be putting the ladder and letters away for good. The one side says, I'm not re-signing, I'm retiring. And the other side is, I'm all out of ideas, I'm signing off. 
Over the years, Bob's witty writing has caught the attention of people from across Vancouver. And while the sign started out as a way to market the business, it quickly turned into an outlet for the print shop owner to express his humor and creativity. As it's been going on for years, people, people will actually drive out of their way, come in, tell me how much they enjoy the sign. And that's, you know, it's great. And I've admired Bob for the whole time that he's been doing this. And after Bob took to social media to announce his retirement, he was blown away by the response, with hundreds of people sharing their fondest memories online. It really means a lot to me, you know, that this sign actually did make a difference, especially when you see ones where people have said, you know, they're having a real bad day, walk by the sign, cheers them up. For some, Bob's retirement is bittersweet. This video on TikTok shows one Vancouver resident crying over the news. The video reaching more than 180,000 views. Well, I told my wife to embrace her mistakes. She hugged me. Bob says he's created about 700 different signs, using the same five lines in up to 13 characters. Each idea jotted down in this red folder. So I actually printed off a little grid that I can actually write the sign in and know if it's going to fit. In a few weeks, Bob will be signing off for the final time. A legacy of laughter and tradition community members hope will continue for years to come. I want Bob to retire, but I don't want the jokes to retire. Bob says he will be handing his red folder over to the new owners, but what they do with those same five lines will be out of his hands. A lot of felt pens on these letters. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, North Vancouver. Oh, what a nice story, Bob. You're a rock star. Thank you for your years of service and laughter. I hope your retirement's great. Those new owners, if you need some help, you know, uh, one Dan Burt here in our newsroom is pretty good. He's pretty punny, so he might be a person to tap into. All right, that does it for us tonight. Thank you for joining us tonight at CBC News at 6. And if you're not already watching us on CBC Gem, you might want to try that. That is our free app. And uh, Anita Bath will be back in the chair tomorrow. Have a good one.